Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to the Clarinet.com podcast. On today's show, you might be expecting to hear from Peter Spriggs, um, but Peter and I actually got chatting and decided that I'm going to make a road trip out there at the end of March, and we're going to talk on location at the Clarinet Center in Penticton, BC, and we're also going to do some some videos of clarinet maintenance tips and, and talk about some things like that. It's going to be really great. I'm excited about it. And I think it's going to just be some fantastic content to share with, with listeners. So the guest on today's show then will be Daryl Caswell. And Daryl is an interesting guest in several ways, not least because he's the first clarinet guest who's not solely a clarinet player. Um, as he says himself, he, he has a repair business, so he, he coined or he mentioned that he thought he was maybe one of the worst clarinet players in the world, but he can still do it. Um, he also is the first guest that I've interviewed in person on location. It just so happens that he lives in Calgary. In addition to his repair business, he is the principal horn player for the Red Deer Symphony. He's also played with the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra. He has, of course, the Landwell Reed Knife Company, which he helped co-found and is the owner of. And that came to be through his work as an engineer, which he also is um, an engineering instructor at the University of Calgary. So he's extremely well, well-rounded, well multifaceted. We had an amazing conversation, and I really look forward to sharing it with you today. So there was a couple other things I've been wanting to kind of mention before we start, but the last few episodes have been really long, so I've been trying to keep my chatter to a minimum. Um, first of all, it's really important to me to know what your feedback is regarding the podcast, and if you have anything you'd like me to announce on the show that's of interest or talk about or address, uh, I'd like to do that. So I've set up an email address. It's feedback at clarineat.com. That's feedback at clarineat.com. Of course, you can also post on any of the social media forums your questions or thoughts or message them directly. Um, and I want to ask a small favor this week. The podcast has really exploded in popularity, but if you could tell one friend about it, that would really help spread the word and, and get it out there. And I've got some really fantastic guests coming up. I'm going to be announcing in the wrap-up episode at the end of January here. But the more people we can get interested in generating a buzz about this, the, the easier it will be for me to get even more amazing guests on the show. So without further ado, here's the interview with Daryl Caswell. I think you're really going to enjoy this. I sure, I sure enjoyed talking with him. Hi, Daryl, and welcome to the Clarinet.com podcast. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. My pleasure. So you've had an incredibly diverse career and very successful. You currently play professional horn at the Red Deer Symphony, and you're a senior instructor at the University of Calgary in engineering. Um, before we delve into the knives, would you mind sharing how you got a start in your career? Well, I started when I was a kid, you know, elementary school. I was all into making stuff like uh, soapbox cars, and I made a radio out of a toilet paper tube with wire wrapped around it. And uh, I was just fascinated by how stuff gets made. And then I had nothing to do with music at all. And then in grade seven, I remember uh, my friend came home at lunch one day and he joined the band and he opened up his case and there was this trumpet and I thought my god what a fantastic thing to do with a piece of metal what a great machine and wouldn't you know a year later the band director came and said so do you want to play in the band and I said can I play a trumpet he said yeah sure and I said okay I'm in so I went into the band and they of course didn't give me a trumpet they gave me an e-flat alto horn which doesn't even exist anymore but a year later they gave me a French horn, and it was like absolutely the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And about the same time, I was now learning to play, and I was approaching it just as another, you know, piece of machinery. And I'm sitting there in band playing away and listening to the music, and then I said, well, geez, what are these, how come my cheeks are all wet, you know? Tears are streaming down my face as I'm playing. And and, and I realized, well, I didn't realize, but at that point, I developed this extremely intense emotional connection to the sound and that pretty much has lasted my whole life long and so I, I I became kind of both this you know maker and the player at the at the same time and I just would sort of oscillate between one and the other if I wasn't in orchestra rehearsal when I was in high school I would be under the hood of my car trying to supercharge my old 1953 Austin with a hairdryer <laughs> and life just kept going on like that and 
And, you know, I, I, de I had to decide after high school what I was going to do, and I realized that, you know, you don't pick up an instrument and become a professional player at age 32. And I realized that if I was going to do music, I had to do it now. So I went off to the University of Toronto and, and developed my musical career until I ended up back in the Calgary Philharmonic. And then I kind of got to the point where I decided, well, it's time to, you know, now time to develop the other side of my brain. So I, I stopped playing full time and, and, you know, got into the Red Year Orchestra, which was a, a less of a, it's not a full time commitment. And that gave me the time to uh, uh, start all over again in engineering school. And so I got into engineering school and initially I thought, OK, I'm done with music. But, you know, I had all these bad dreams about standing on stage in my pajamas with my horn in my hand, ready to play concerto, and I hadn't practiced. So I realized I can't, you know, it, it, as somebody said, music gets in your blood, it doesn't come out. So I was going to have to do both at the same time. And that's when I started looking to see what could I do with engineering and science that would let me still work within the arts and and involved in a way to make stuff that people use to make beautiful things and that's really where it got going hmm. so you kind of started at the same time that it wasn't really a you don't remember a separation of one coming first particularly well i mean i'd have to say that you know in the things that i was doing when i was a kid that other people weren't doing it was basically science and engineering related and when i was you know seven eight nine i was always building stuff and then there was a real change, sea change in grade eight when I discovered the sound of music. And so I kind of put away all the things I was doing, although, you know, I very quickly then got into cars. So that, so then they existed kind of side by side, I guess. So I recall one of my engineering roommates during university telling me about uh, how interesting your classes were. It was kind of funny at the time, actually, because I remember that I knew you as a player and wasn't aware that you were teaching at the U of C in yeah. engineering. And uh, in a way, I owe you some thanks because it kind of legitimized what the three of us musicians were doing to the other two engineering roommates, and we kind of got along a little oh, better great. after, the, yeah, after that. Great. Some interesting conversation. Um, but anyways, he talked about some time when you played, a, I think it was a garden hose with yeah. a French horn mouth piece. Yeah. Do you want to talk about what that experiment or what that demonstrated? Well, to me, you know, what I try to do with the engineering students is, is like you say, is, is elevate the level of the musician and the artist in their eyes because they tend to be quite uh, biased about, you know, science is everything and, and arts is just fluff. And so I would say, you know, it really doesn't matter what kind of an instrument I play. It's the years and years and years of practice and learning how to create sound to uh, address or, or elicit emotions from people. And to make that point, I'd say, you know, I play French horn professionally, but, you know, I'm not going to play my horn for you because you'll just think, oh, well, that's a, you know, a $25,000 instrument, of course, that sounds good. I said, I'm going to show you how much is intellectual and how much is, is inside the, the player. So I just pick up and I play a, a garden hose. I play Brahms' uh, first symphony. <laughs> and, you know, the thing about a garden hose is I probably sound better on a garden hose almost than a French horn just because of the acoustical nature of the garden hose. But the thing is that invariably I play that wherever I play on the garden hose, people burst into applause before I'm, I'm finished. And a lot of it is, and I tell them, it's not because it's this odd thing. It's because you finally, because I've taken away the instrument and you can't be impressed with the beauty of the instrument. It's strictly how I've structured the phrases that makes you excited, you know. And that, so I use that all the time to try and show even musicians that, you know, it's what we do inside our heads that and, and how we connect one note to another that makes the music. It's not whether we push the buttons down in the correct order or have a, you know, a nice fancy instrument to do it with. And since then, you've also started a, a science and engineering and music presentation that you take with, to schools with some other colleagues. What's, what's that called? Yeah, it's a, a woodwind quintet we're called the Perfect Cadence. And what we're after is to do two things. One is in the school system to keep arts at the forefront, because it, especially when, the, when a financial downturn comes, first thing that goes is the, are the arts programs. And yet, when you look at what um, employers want, 
they're not asking for people to have, you know, A's in, in math and science because people already have that. What they're asking are people who can work with work work on a team with others, who are self motivated, who are creative thinkers. Those are all the skills that we do in the arts, but people don't really realize that that's where it comes from. And so, in what we've tried to do in the schools is offer an explanation of music and an explanation of sound or, or the science of sound together so that students hopefully will see early on in their lives that these are both important things and one does not supersede the other and in fact they can feed into each other in, in ways that can make them better at whatever they're doing so we do that and then the other thing that we'd be doing is in we do we're developing adult recitals where it's almost like a elder hostel kind of thing where I'll stand up there and the first thing they'll they'll hear, the audience hears, is me playing a conch shell. And then we'll walk through, why does a conch shell, which is like the oldest instrument there could possibly be, why does that still sound so fantastic? And then I take the sound apart, I'll show them the sound spectrum on a screen and then I'll take it apart and show them why it sounds beautiful to them. And what, I'm tr what we're trying to do there is wake the audience's ears back up because audiences today struggle so much with a proliferation of three-minute songs on, on the radio and everywhere, advertisements, you can't escape it. But to actually sit in a concert and listen to a full artistic piece is almost impossible for an audience to do these days. So what we're trying to do is, is allow them sort of in a, in a gourmet chef terminology, we're allowing them to clean their palates of their ears and realize just how magnificent something like a perfect cadence, for instance, is. If you, if you take it out of the context and show them what it is and then plug it back into the piece, and we found it's been quite successful. Many people have said, you know, I'll never, I'll never listen to music the same again now that I've understood how it's structured. So that's the kind of thing we're after. You know, it's so true. And it makes me think of uh, a couple things, actually. The first one is a lot of people say when they're thinking about music, like, oh, I'd, I'd rather not know more about it because it would somehow affect my enjoyment of it. And I always think, like, well, do you like football? Do you, yeah. <laughs> do you know the rules to the game? Like, yeah. you like cooking, but how would you feel if you couldn't cook anything? Like, it's, a, it's kind of a ridiculous thing to... Yeah, and I think what I say about the way the world exists right now is like when you're going to a concert, you know, you got the car radio on, they've got elevator music. It's as if you were going to a, a gourmet meal where you were going to pay, you know, hundreds of dollars for this gourmet meal, but you're going to stop at McDonald's on the way and have a hamburger. <laughs> you know, it's the same kind of thing. You've, you've got to find, we've got to find a way to kind of give our ears a break and allow them to come back to where... You know, the sound of a conch shell is as thrilling as it was, you know, 4,000 years ago. Yeah. We also remind me, um, just about talking about what people do with music after, even if they're not musicians. I guess one of the more lofty goals with this whole idea is that eventually maybe interviewing people like, uh, there's so many famous people or, or um, uh, actors or business people who've started somehow in music, like... I was told the other day that Adele, that singer, played clarinet in band. Oh, yeah, really? And Woody Allen plays clarinet yeah. quite successfully, actually. And Bill yeah. Clinton plays clarinet and saxophone. And all these people, Jim Carrey, <laughs> another one. And it'd just be so interesting to hear, like, do they feel that music affected them in a meaningful way for acting or being the president? <laughs> or, yeah. You know? And, you know, this is something I do. I offer to the band directors because I, I run a music repair business. And I offer to come in and talk to their band parents because when a musician goes and talks to a band parents or the band director talks to the band parents, and, well, they really should be in music because, you know, it just, it just makes you into, like, a better person. And the parents are like, yeah, all right, you know, I want my kid to get a job, so we're, giving them, we're taking them out of band, we're putting them in math. Mm -hmm. So when I go up there and I say, you know, I'm the first person in engineering that your kids are going to see. And what I want to see is I want to see the kids who've been in band because all the things that that companies want engineers to be able to do, to be team players, to be self-motivated, to be creative thinkers, to be sensitive to people around them. Those are all the things you learn every single day in band. And so when I've got kids that come out of the band program, I know there's so many things I don't have to teach them because we, my courses were all around uh, team-oriented design where we're working with problems in the communities and helping them figure out what, what solutions might look like. 
And, you know, invariably, it was the band students when they had to give a presentation. The band students are up there. They rehearsed. They've got their stuff memorized. And they deliver these fantastic um, uh, design reviews, whereas the non-music uh, people uh, think that, well, I just, I'll just i write all my stuff out on a little card, and I'll just sort of read the card. And, you know, it's awful what the, what comes out. So you, you, I show the, the, the band parents how many skills their kids are gaining that you can't get any other way. You, it doesn't matter where you go. You can go into athletics and you're not going to get the sense of empathy that, that musicians have. And you can go into, into any other field and you're not going to get that level of, of awareness. Somebody said once, uh, what they love about having a musician in their, on their staff is a musician can walk into a meeting room and essentially read the room and know who's mm -hmm. feeling good, who's feeling bad, yeah. and how to treat those people. Because, you know, we sit in orchestra, you got to know when the guy beside you has come in and his wife has just left him, that maybe he's not going to be coming in in exactly the right spot. And you better be watching for that, you know, yeah. because otherwise you're going to fall on your face. So it's really, a, you know, when the band parents, I'm quite pleased to, to say that when the band parents hear me say that, because I'm an engineer, they say, okay, our kids are staying in band. And then the yeah. band, band directors have told me that, and I think that's a great thing. Well, it makes me think, too, um, have you ever seen that PDQ Bach thing where they uh, they announced the orchestra? I think it's Beethoven uh, five in C minor with the, um, as if it's a football game. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's it's great. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's so it's funny. Great. Oh, yeah. the horn really missed that note yeah. there. That's, <laughs> that's true. That's, oh, he's not going to be back for the next season. He might yeah. be getting transferred to the... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's... Uh, that kind of thing, though, I, I showed a student that the other day, and, and he couldn't believe that, like, you could analyze it in that way. Yeah. It's like, oh, really? There's that much going on? Like, it just sounds like noise, but I never thought that the, maybe the violins, if they don't cut off at that exact point, they do sound like they're, you know, not, not listening, or <laughs> they're playing against the conductor or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I remember a, a conductor, he was actually a vocal teacher here in town who showed me, I was already a professional musician, he showed me why it is that a dotted eight sixteenth has to be played exactly in rhythm because because if you don't, for a split second, you're going to be clashing harmonically with whatever, wherever you were hanging over too long on the dotted eighth, for instance. Yeah. And you know that's going to give this little smidgen of dissonance in a place where you don't want it, and you keep doing that over a whole concert, and you know you realize that okay, I've I've really damaged the, the musical product because I've been imprecise. Yeah, and it's it's so funny too because I have noticed um, that when you play like with with orchestral sensitivity and like Stravinsky or Mahler, they were very very clear about exactly the duration of the notes. And if they want a note to be tied over the measure to exactly a sixteenth, they'll mark that right. Yeah. But then you get to a lot of band repertoire nowadays, and they think that the students can't count, so they'll tie it over to a quarter note to make it clear they weren't right. held to the bar line, but then the really sensitive players in the room are holding it till count two. Yeah. You know, and this happens all the time, and I, I, it's hard to know, though, without a score, whether it's intentional or they just want to make sure you hold it to the bar line. It, it's not Yeah. It's not clear at all. So. And I'll find, you know, what, what I do with my music students when I was teaching horn is is what they didn't understand was that music, a musical phrase is a narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would tell them, they play a phrase, and i tell them a story that I would just make up on the spot that would fit, you know, their lives. Like if they played baseball, I'd say, okay, well, here, here's how the game is set up, and here's at this point in the phrase, you know, the guy's got his bat, and then he makes the big strike, and he strikes out, so it's terrible. And here's how the music all fits into that. And it really opened their eyes to see that, wow, there's a lot more going on here. And and they would sort of wake up to the fact that they have to tell the story, and where the phrase, which is where the phrasing comes in, and the rhythm. If the rhythm's not right, then the story gets screwed up, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, it's even funny how musical performance techniques kind of, uh, even for me, a musician. Like I remember when I graduated university and I started, you know, teaching clinics and stuff like that. I started thinking, well, wow, I wish I was playing more and this and that and blah blah blah. But instead of getting kind of down on the idea of teaching clinics, I sort of tried to look at them as a performance, like, I need to have a 60-minute version of this, I need to have a 90-minute version of this, mm -hmm. someone could have me in for three hours, like, how am I going to expand on that theme, or, <laughs> I, I often treat it like playing a concerto, it's like, I have these things I have to get through, and, and these phrases and structure, and it's totally memorized, and I can get through it in however long I need. Yeah, and I think that's really important, in fact, I did the same thing when I first got out of university, and I was doing teaching in Toronto, you know, same kind of thing. And I would spend, if I had, for a long time, if I had a half hour lesson coming up, 
I would spend an hour thinking about what I'm going to do with this kid and how I'm going to, you know, mm -hmm. get them to do this, this, or that. and you know, over the years, then you've got enough sort of tools in your toolbox that you don't have to spend so much time prior time. But yeah, I spent same thing. I spent a huge amount of time putting a lesson together as a as a sort of narrative experience for the student, and I think that. You know, I had a fairly good reputation as a teacher, so, you know, I, I think a lot of that is why. Mm -hmm. So we kind of segued into the question about, um, I wanted to make sure that even though you don't play clarinet, have you ever played clarinet or always brass? Well, I always play brass, but since I've gotten into the repair business, I've got to be able to play all these instruments. Yeah, I so, guess. I so I'm like the worst clarinet player in the world, but <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> well, yeah, I wanted to make sure we get some got some musical advice from you, but I think that's, uh, that's some great stuff we just talked about there. Um so I'm sure many of our listeners may be wondering um, how it is that a French horn player came to invent a reed knife. What's the story behind your company, Landwell Knives? Well, you know, as I, as I was saying, I got into engineering and I realized that I could not uh, just erase the musical side of my being. So I started to look for things that would allow me to, to do both. And in third year, I realized I, that I, a couple of years down the road, I was going to be able to take an independent course where I could do whatever I wanted. And so I started fishing around thinking, okay, well, I'm going to do something that combines my musical knowledge that I've spent all these years and years acquiring with my engineering, engineering knowledge, which I've only really spent, you know, two or three years so far acquiring. And I just started fishing around and, and you know, Yes, I could have just started doing something with French horn. But my philosophy in my entire life has been you should never do what it is that is in front of you. You know, if you're good at playing French horn then and you want to do something unique, don't try and do it on French horn because you're gonna, your thinking is going to be too blinkered by all of your past experience. So I wanted to find something that was not horn related that I would be able to come to with you know, fresh, open mind on both the music side and the um, uh, science side, so I went back to the orchestra where I, I, you know, stopped playing with the Calgary Philharmonic and just sort of talked to the guys. Is that if I'd go and play it or sub in at a concert or something, I'd start to talk to people about you know well, what do you need? And the bass players say, oh man, we really need a new stool because you know our backs are killing us, you know, and <laughs> and everybody sort of had a thing that was they they'd like to have, and I was trying to pick and choose what would be the right thing. And just at that moment, I was taking metallurgy in as a third year course, and uh, Gene Landa, who's a principal oboe in the Calgary Philharmonic, said, you know, nobody's ever solved this problem of scraping knife, and I've talked to metallurgists, and they think we're just a bunch of crazy musicians, but there's a real problem here. And I well, what the heck, here I am taking a, a metallurgical course, and, you know, in, in a science and engineering, you, the, the stuff you're learning has been developed by brilliant minds, and it's all there in a textbook. So I thought, well, why don't I just see if I can do something there? And Gene was all worried, well, I don't want you to flunk your course, you know. <laughs> but I said, no, 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 I think, I think we could do something here. So so we just started to work together, you know, and, and my job was to translate what he was saying as a practitioner, as a musician, into something that we could use as as a uh, in a scientific context. So, uh, and, and in fact, to me, that, that if there's any skill that I have, that's what it is, is being able to translate from one um, discipline into another. And, and once you can do that kind of stuff, it makes you so powerful because you can see parts of a problem that other people just can't see. So, so that's what I did. I just you know, went into the metallurgical guy and said, I want to use the lab. I pay my fees. And so I have access to millions of dollars worth of, of research equipment because I'm paying my fees. And so you know, he let me into the lab, showed me how to use it. And of course, he he said, you know, it, when I said this is what I want to do to work on, on knives for oboe players, he said, well, of course that's a stupid thing to do because, you know, these are just musicians; they don't know what they're talking about. And I said, yeah, but you know, I'm going to look anyway. And what came out of that was uh, after a year of working in the laboratory, working with electron microscopes and all this kind of stuff, and I, I got a sense of okay, I know what the problem is, I know what we're looking for. There's a certain kind of microscopic structure that would do what I wanted, what, what we needed this to do. And one day I'm working on the microscope and I see this structure right in front of me on, in the microscope. And I, and I got running down to the technicians who, had, who were doing the 
making the samples for him. And I said, what did you do with this sample? And the guy said, I don't want to tell you. And I said, no, 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 you have to tell me. And he says, ah, I screwed it all up, you know. And I said, I don't care. I don't. You just tell me what you did. <laughs> so he told me what he did, and I went back and, and reworked the theory according to the mistake that he'd made and came up with this theory for making um, uh, abrasion-resistant, super fine, super hard edges that to this day, nobody, I'm the only person who knows how to do that. And and uh, it, it's, you know, technology that doesn't exist anywhere else. And I'm certainly not about to tell anybody until... <laughs> until so that'd uh, be a bad question for me to ask next. <laughs> yeah. Well, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you have a proprietary... Is it an edge, then, that's proprietary, or the whole material? It's basically the material selection, the heat treatment, and the manufacturing process are all essentially a, a trade secret. I mean, I never did a patent because, you know... For those clarinet players who want to patent stuff, all that has to happen, it costs you $25,000 just to protect yourself in Canada. You know, probably $100,000 in North America. And somebody in some other continent can just say, yeah, it's a good idea. I think I'll just take that. And they can take it. And unless you've got millions of dollars in your back pocket to sue them, you're just going to lose out. So I just said, I, I'm, you know, nobody could ever figure this out in a million years. So I'm just keeping yeah. it as a trade secret, essentially. Hmm. So a lot of uh, double reed players are really used to using knives, and I think sometimes single reed players, myself included, are sometimes a little intimidated and not quite sure entirely what they're doing, as well as the double reed players. Um, if I was to consider buying a knife as a clarinetist or saxophonist, what, what type should I look at and what's the difference? Well, certainly you're right in that you know, clarinet and saxophone don't require the extreme level of finesse that an oboist does. I mean, they're, they're basically removing one fiber at a time. Mm -hmm. and, and you guys don't need that level, although you never know. But uh, for that reason, that's one of the reasons I make the bevel. It's made basically for bassoonists, uh, clarinet players, and sax players because it gives you an edge. The bevel forms the right angle for the edge, so the edge is always there. Whereas on, an, on a double reed knife, you're putting that edge on just about every day, and that's one of the great skills of the oboes is being able to do that. So you don't want to do that. You want to just take a bevel, which, you know, you take it out of the case next week, it's going to be right there for you, ready to use it. The only thing about a bevel is if you once put the knife on the sharpening stone wrong, you'll screw it up. So you have to be, you have to be very careful how you sharpen the, the bevel. And just so listeners are aware, um, we're, we just made a really great video that talks about how to sharpen the knives and take care of them. It's going to be on the YouTube um, page there. It's only about six minutes long, so if you're interested in that, make sure you go check it out. And um, you're so passionate about that issue of, of knife care, you actually wrote a book on the subject, and I, I checked it out a little bit. It's pretty, <laughs> looks quite a bit beyond me. Um, do you have anything you want to say about that on, on the podcast here? Well, as well? Cer certainly the reason I wrote this little book is, you know, there's no point in making a knife that, you know, where the, the science and technology behind it make it completely unique in the world and the sharpest knife that you could possibly ever get in this field. There's no point in doing that if nobody knows how to sharpen. And I, I'd seen uh, so many problems when people would you know, buy a knife and then they'd send knives back for me to regrind. I'd see these horrendous knives coming back to me. Where, and I realized that you know, these people have, have not got a clue how to actually look after or sharpen a knife. So again, I took the, the same basic approach. I said, okay, here's what the musicians need. Here's what their approach is. And then I'm going to find something in between that makes sense from an engineering standpoint because they were doing, as I show in the video, doing all kinds of crazy stuff where they they didn't have control over any aspect of the knife, so they would ruin the knife in in a matter of moments, thinking that they were doing the right thing, just like their teacher told them, you know, hold it like this, cross your legs like that, hold your face like this, and now rub really fast, and you know, whatever they were doing, it was all these these uh, mythical things that had been passed down from teacher to student and reinterpreted, and, and they become some sort of mantra that has, after a while, no bearing in reality. And so I just wanted to say, well, let's take the sharpening, the act of sharpening, and turn it into a very solid, well-founded, scientific, practical process. And that's what the book was for. Hmm. So you've been very generous with the giveaway on the podcast for this episode, and, and one person is going to be lucky enough to win one of your knives. Um, which model is it that 
is going to be included, and what can you tell us about it? It's a right-handed bevel, and and you know the, the oboe knives come in three different kinds of of performance levels. You could say a hard, medium, and soft, which is about only the best way we could think of to describe it. So there's, at a very fine level, there's three different behaviors of the edge. But on a bevel, uh, you since you're not at that level, it, it is a f- sort of the a middle of the road, which means that it's very easy to, it's very reliable. It gives you a really good um, uniform edge throughout the life of the knife. And as I said, the only thing you have to worry about with this bevel, whoever gets it, is whenever you sharpen it, you make sure that that bevel sits on the flat of the stone and you never, ever, ever lift it. You, and you'll always be tempted. You'll think, if I just lift it up a little, it would sharpen that much quicker. As soon as you do that, you've screwed the knife. So never, ever, ever do that. And the other thing is is never f- sharpen from the back of the knife because, again, you'll, you'll wreck it. So you put the bevel on there. Uh, you lie it flat on the stone, rub only on that, and then the only time you would put it up, turn it on the back is maybe to clean the burr off with a very light little swipe. But the biggest problem people make with bevels is they try to hurry the process along and lift the, the knife, lift the bevel off the stone, which puts more pressure on the on the edge. And yes, you get a good edge once, and then the knife is wrecked. Hmm. So, do you have any advice for the actual adjusting of the reeds themselves? Well, since I, you know, I've very studiously avoided making reeds so I don't get caught up in the in the myth mythology of it all. I I don't have anything specific to say, but I will say that um, my entire career, you know, the not doing a French horn project in engineering is, is a perfect example. If you go out into the, you know, don't look at what clarinet players are doing to to um, uh, work on their reeds. First thing you want to do is go find somebody who does outrageous things with reeds like oboe players. I mean, they make it from scratch all mm-hmm. the time. And they think about it in such a much more refined way that if you sit down and learn about what they do, by the time you come back to looking at a clarinet reed, you're going to have a way better idea and a much broader, deeper, richer um, body of knowledge to draw from. Whereas if you just sort of say, well, let's see what other clarinet players do, you right away you've blinkered yourself and you're not liable. You're not going to be able to do any better than anybody else does. But if you stretch out and, and look elsewhere, just like my teacher in Chicago used to say, my horn teacher, say, you know, don't play horn music for God's sake. You know, play trumpet music, play vocal music, play opera scores, play everything because that's what's going to inform your playing and I would say mm-hmm. exactly the same thing about about our reed work. So you're also a skilled repairman. Um, you do work on all instruments or just woodwinds? No I do well I do all band instruments essentially. Oh sorry that's what I meant. Do, what about string instruments? Uh, I've done tiny bits on string instruments but you know that's it's it's not something I'm I want to special in specialize in and you know the reason that I wanted to be involved in music instrument repair is because I, I love the, the me- mechanical aspect of it, but also it's my way of supporting music education because uh, to me it's it's vital that we support it as well as we possibly can. And, and you know, it's so easy for band directors to say, oh, I'll just give them a computer, we'll do some garage band stuff, we'll call that music education. And, yeah. And I'm you know, so I want to be in there in the front lines trying to keep that going. And like I said, I love the, you know, the, the mechanisms and I and and I get to sit down and learn how to play all this stuff. You know, I was playing a bassoon last week and <laughs> and uh, you know, so I really en- enjoy that whole as- aspect of it because I've always been fascinated with. Well, I, every year I try and make a new musical instrument. My wife and I. You try and make your own instrument. Yeah, so I oh. made. You know, I made steel plate bell plates for the for the CPO that. Uh, oh, I yeah, I was playing that. What, what was that again? Um, must have, it probably was Berlioz Symphony Fantastique. Oh, maybe, yeah, probably yeah. was what it was. Interesting. So um, you had some interesting philosophies we were talking about before we went on air here about instrument cases. Do you, do you want to go into that a little bit? Yeah, I'm quite surprised at looking at instrument design, the instruments themselves, and the cases about how, how little engineering knowledge goes into it with respect to how you prevent your instrument, saxophone in particular, let's say, 
how you protect it from damage because a lot of the structures on a saxophone are basically dent machines. You know, they're, they're um, supports for, uh, uh, you know, the basket over the, the larger keys where anything that actually hits that basket, the rod that, go, that supports the basket is actually going to magnify the amount of load that you put on to, when you hit it and it's going to be that much more susceptible to a dent when, rather than having nothing there. And the same for cases. I mean, there's my horn cases, and I've, I've seen so many cases where the case itself is the cause of the dents, not the dropping of the instrument. Yeah. Because what you have to do when you drop an instrument, as I was, I was saying before, when you can hold an instrument, one molecule, if it's a 100-pound instrument, let's say, you hold it one molecule off the ground and let it go, in that one tiny, tiny little space, it will accelerate to the point that it will uh, a 100 pound instrument becomes a 200 pound instrument, mm -hmm. and so now you got all twice as much weight acting on the instrument. And if you then have a magnifier on there, like a brace in the wrong place, it will just poke a dent into your instrument just easily. And if the case itself has you know lots of foam and styrofoam, but it happens to have a little pointy area where they change from you know one one geometry to another that point even though it's styrofoam can easily have enough uh, uh, rigidity to put a dent in your in your uh, instrument and so I think you know an area of design that I'd actually given a talk on this at a repair conference you know somebody needs to really start doing some serious engineering work on real engineering or real uh, case design it really really does protect the, the the instrument and it's it's quite simple i mean an engineer with first year level statics uh, statist or you know statics course could could do that but nothing's been done well it's funny because once you start looking at stuff too i mean i last time i brought my bass clarinet over here we, we talked about how the case was actually causing the the constant alignment issues and here I was thinking that it was it was me somehow putting it together wrong, or I don't remember dropping it, yeah. but <laughs> all I did was carry it into the car, and, and it's, it's broken again. And, and this is the interesting thing about applying engineering or science principles is that, you know, these forces are invisible to you, but once you start to understand how they're transmitted from one body to another, then you sort of almost start to be able to visualize how uh, forces are traveling through your instrument, and it's, it's a mm -hmm. very... It's a very handy kind of education to have, and you know, any clarinet player could go and sit in on it who's been through high school and had a little, and then you probably don't even need calculus. You could go and sit in on an engineering statics course, and you could learn so much about this very topic just in a, in a first year class, and, and you'd, you know, you'd be able to do it. You'd be able to keep up. You'd be able to understand it. It's really not that difficult. Well, it's interesting because you can't see this obviously listening, but there's a baritone sax that's sitting here. There's a horn. There's a bass clarinet. There's that conch shell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got all kinds of stuff. And when you look at the cases, actually, it seems that they're designed to be aesthetically pleasing when you open them to look at. Yeah. But as soon as you grab it by the handle, I mean, this baritone sax here is going to be sitting on that pipe, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you that's have a the entire problem. weight of that instrument sitting on that one little extremely delicate bendy point. And, and I know when people put saxophones together, they're real hung up on making sure that you don't bend the neck because kids grab it and crank yeah. it. And yeah. so you put that on first, but yet it happens it's when it's in the case yeah, and anyways. You, you throw it in the case and yeah, that's exactly right. And then if, of course, students, you know, a lot of students are not big enough really to haul these very sax cases around. So, they kick them so around. they're kicking them around and hauling them over. I, I got one that student who hauls it over uh, the curb. I put a I, I put a set of um, skateboard wheels on, and you know, a month later she had had torn the the whole thing out of the of the case. Yeah, that's the kind of forces that we're going to put wow. in, into the case. So, so yeah, there's a lot of work to be done that isn't being done on. Well, I was just gonna instrument. say actually, why don't they put those? You know, when you get your luggage, they put more thought into your luggage than they do the instrument. Like, wouldn't it make sense to put one of those handles? And the wheels on the case or something, yeah. so you're not lugging it around like yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've ended up making those for students who were too small for for playing the, the Barry sax, but, you know, they wanted to be Lisa Simpson. Yeah. So, you know, was... Well, even these very microphones we're recording with right now, I mean, when I looked at it in that light, I realized that the case 
it, the way it sets in there, it looks great when you're in the store and you want to buy it. But as soon as you actually pick up the case, the, the entire weight of the microphone is sitting on the edge of the mesh. Yeah. It's going to get dented. In clarinet so. cases, I mean, you know, woodwind cases in particular, there's constant problems with in the, in the band programs where kids will say, oh, I've got no place to put my music. I'll just stuff it into my oh, case yeah, and on just top of crunch the... it down there. And, you know, it's so easy to, to mess those keys up. Yeah, you know, and and that's a that's a big problem. And again, when you tell students to set down the clarinet, you always have them put it on the stand or set it down in a way that doesn't bend the keys. But then they slap it in the case and turn it upside down to carry on the bus, and the keys are all resting on themselves yeah. anyway. So, and it's that kind of stuff where, like I said, it's it's invisible until you start to learn just a very little about about how th bodies get loaded, and all of a sudden you start to to be able to see, oh, that's a really bad way to have that in this yeah. case. Exactly. There's another brand actually called Rossi Clarinets, and they've thought about this. You, when you buy them, they come with a tenon cap that then sits in the case. Yeah. And then that, that helps prevent this. But those are, you know, extremely expensive and very, very nice. And and uh, you can't expect that level of maybe care with a Well, I end up, you know, with my horn case, I mean, I just tore everything out and put it back in so it made sense. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've actually seen people, I think Tom Pawlowski was on last week. He, he sometimes posts pictures on Facebook, and I noticed once it looked like he was using one of those professional camera cases where you just pull out the foam or a gun case or something oh, yeah, yeah. where you just do the foam pull outs and then you can make it exactly what you want yeah and it's way more insulated so um so we kind of diverted there a little bit but is there anything else you wanted to to add before we wrap up or no i think you know my my what i try and encourage all musicians to do now that i've you know i've been a musician and an engineer and i see people in orchestras who or, or either, you know, coming out of music school who don't get into orchestras or getting into orchestras and then for six years down the road saying, you know, this isn't really what I thought it was going to be. And I guess, and both kinds of people say, I guess I have nothing to offer to the world because <laughs> I can only play clarinet. But if you go and you look, like just go and open up the newspaper and read what companies want, and you'll see stuff in there where they'll say, you know, we need somebody who's, you know, uh, got who's self-motivated. Well, what do you think it takes to sit in a, in a in a practice room for three hours a day while all your friends, engineering friends, are out drinking, having parties, and you're sitting in? You know, that's where you learn self-motivation. And so you you go through all those lists of what employers want. You know, creative problem solving. Well, what do you think's happening when you're trying to work yourself work your way through a phrase in a way that makes sense? You know. Yeah. And, you know, teamwork and empathy and all those things that they're having a hard time getting. They're, the school system, education system, science system, math system is not providing those. Whereas we as musicians have those in spades. What we don't know, we don't appreciate it because everybody around us has it. Mm -hmm. and so when you're moving out or, you, you know, you don't get the job you wanted or you decide you're going to move on, you know, my best advice is translate every one of those things that an employer is looking for into what it would mean musically and you'll find out you got it in spades but yeah i can i mean i could take every success i ever had in life whether it's music or engineering and i can point directly back to band class is where i learned to do this yeah and so that's why i, I do the repair stuff and and talk to the band parents because we have to get them past the idea of, oh well you play music you're you're just a better person and get down to real specifics of these are the things that that are required for the employee, the, for the workforce of the future. And the only place you're learning them is band. You're not learning them in any other class. And that's, that's a really valuable thing for parents to know because it's so easy for them to say, ah, it's not worth it. Let's get a computer. Let's do it. It must, surely it must be that if our kids have lots of computers, they're going to be more employable. <laughs> and that's not true because everybody has computers. And what is true is that very few people are learning empathy, teamwork, self-motivation, creative problem solving. That's what's not being taught. Yeah. And I almost see at some point there'll be a bit of a backlash, um, almost kind of like the, the trend right now towards vinyl instead of digital music. I think there'll come a day where people are more enticed to learn like a clarinet instead of some sort of synthesizer because it has this sort of real connection to it. Yeah, I mean, to me, the thing about a synthesizer, for instance, is you can listen to one. They used to bring it into the pits, and they thought, we'll get rid of all the musicians. We'll just have a synthesizer. And yes, for the first 10 seconds, you'll think that you're hearing, or whatever, a, a real clarinet. But then about 
15 seconds you go you know i never want to hear that again <laughs> and and so they've they did discover that you know if you can use a synthesizer uh, uh, andrew lloyd weber does it beautifully you know where he only uses synthesized sound when that's the only thing that he the only way to get the sound he needs otherwise he uses real sound all the time and that's why his stuff sounds so great because there if you don't have an instrument that you have to give your mind body and soul to then there's no music coming out the other end well yeah and it's kind of like any other aspect of uh i think that synthesizers and and, and that kind of uh instrument when they're used to their own ends they sound really interesting like if you think about a moog or a, a rhodes piano that's kind of its own instrument mm -hmm. it kind of gives a really new element to music but when they design a synthesizer almost uh schemorphically to try and be a clarinet or, or whatever it always lacks that it's not a clarinet yeah to me i remember somebody came at a workshop i was teaching and they brought a clarinet synthesizer and and the guy was trying to sort it out and, and i said to him well you know the thing is that you know because you're already a well-developed musician you'll be able to figure out how to do something with that uh, synthesizer that'll be interesting but you couldn't use that synthesizer to train your mind to be a musician because it requires nothing from you mm -hmm. whereas a clarinet requires all kinds of stuff from you and that's the problem is you know a real musician can make music with a chair but you can't use a chair to train a musician yeah and so that's... if we make the instruments so technically um, accessible that you can you know just push a button and then phrase comes out well that's nice, but uh, that's all that will ever come out. And mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the big problems. Once once you're a developed artist, artists use technology in fantastic ways, as do yeah. real musicians. But the problem is the public and the education system starts to see the technology. Oh, well, we'll just bring the technology in. We don't have to train the mind anymore. Yeah. And that's when the bad stuff happens. Well, I think we had a really great conversation. Um, so we can find you online at the clarinet.com YouTube channel with the video we just made there about caring for your reed knives and we're going to be putting some of your products up for sale on the clarinet website um i'm going to put some links there and some other information about about this book and uh how to get in touch and um yeah i think that's great thanks for coming on the podcast today thank you to be eligible to win product mentioned on the clarinet.com podcast you can follow us on five forms of social media. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, and YouTube. The winners will be pulled from these five sources. If you find that you're enjoying the podcast, you can support it in five ways. You can follow and interact on social media sites, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can follow the podcast itself and post positive reviews on the podcast medium of your choice, including SoundCloud, iTunes, or Stitcher. You can also watch it on YouTube. You can discuss and share content on your own blog or social media site with your friends, colleagues, students, and family. You can complete our listener survey at clarinet.com slash podcast, or you can support the podcast directly by making a donation or purchasing your neat and new clarinet products from the clarinet.com online store at clarinet.com slash store. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.